get him up. John Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker Saturday. It is impossible to escape the frightening headlines that we are headed for a climate catastrophe. Climate change is an existential threat. We must act immediately or the world might end. That is a narrative that overwhelms the media landscape. And other scientists who question the threat get very little media attention. In fact, you would think there is no other side to the debate. But just a few weeks ago, Nobel Prize winner Dr. John Clauser proclaimed there is no climate crisis. The popular narrative, he says, about climate change reflects a dangerous corruption of science that threatens the world's economy and the well-being well of billions of people. Misguided climate science, he says, has metastasized into a massive shock journalistic pseudoscience. 1,600 scientists from around the world recently signed a declaration dismissing the existence of a climate crisis, insisting that carbon dioxide is beneficial to Earth. Dr. Judith Curry is a climatologist, former chair of the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology. She's now gone independent. Judith, good to see you. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Judith, how well do we know the science at this moment? Oh, that this is, you know, climate change is an exceedingly complex topic. There are many uncertainties, even some unknown unknowns. Um, it's a relatively young science. Um, and, you know, when you hear about the consensus surrounding climate change, it's a manufactured consensus and it covers some very narrow territory um, that really doesn't address the most consequential issues. The bottom line is that our ability to predict the climate into the future is very minimal. So when we in the weather world, which we're always in in the news business, we've got a pretty good handle on maybe four days out predicting weather. Beyond that, it's a little sketchy. So how in the world do climate models accurately predict what's going to happen 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 years from now? Well, what the climate models doing, are doing is addressing how the weather and climate would respond to external forcing. You know, if you change the input of solar radiation or you change the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this, you know, from a crude energy balance perspective, you can infer some very basic things, but it doesn't tell us anything about um, how the actual weather and climate variability is going to play out on, you know, time scales from weeks to decades, which is what we care about. And right now, it seems that we have settled on CO2, carbon dioxide, as the climate change control knob, that if we just lower CO2, which is about 420 parts per million right now, by the way, is 420 parts per million historically significant? Have we been higher and lower before? Uh, yes, we've been higher before, we've been lower before. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not <laughs> approaching any crazy boundary um, that we haven't seen before on the planet. Well, it, and when you talk about 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, a submarine is between six and 8,000 parts per million CO2. So it would seem that we're hardly at some threshold of death. Well, well, the climate issue is that carbon dioxide has an infrared emission spectra, which gives it the so-called greenhouse effect, which acts towards warming the planet. So that's the issue. Oxygen and nitrogen, which are far more abundant in the atmosphere, don't have an infrared emission spectra. So, so that's the issue with carbon dioxide. The issue is more blanketing uh, the atmosphere and trapping heat, right? Trapping heat, yeah. Okay. So as we look at this right now, the, there, there's this idea that we have reached some consensus on this, that CO2, all things being equal, does warm the planet. And there is general agreement on that, correct? Yes. But then the, the, the disagreement starts into the area of how big of a problem is this? 
And that's where you get divergent viewpoints. Yeah, I mean, we don't know how much warming is associated with adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. We don't know how big this warming is relative to natural climate variability. We disagree as to whether warming is dangerous. And then we disagree as to whether eliminating fossil fuels um, will be better for mankind. Um, so you authored this paper in 2005 and your expertise is on hurricanes. That's one of your areas of expertise. And you said uh, yeah. you thought that global warming was intensifying the strength of hurricanes and cyclones, right? Well, it was a little bit more complicated, nuanced than that. I mean, what we found was an increase in the percent of category four and five hurricanes. And this was coincident with the overall trend in warming sea surface temperatures, which was consistent with global warming. So, I mean, we didn't directly attribute it to global warming, but the media picked up on that angle immediately. And we got a lot of immediate attention. And at the time, I felt that the responsible thing to do was to support the IPCC consensus in my public statements. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That is kind of the vanguard of which everything is ferreted out. When, when the IPCC kind of says it, that becomes consensus science. But there are a lot of scientists out there now who are questioning whether the IPCC has become a political body, not a scientific body. Well, yeah, well, the IPCC has its roots in politics. Um, you know, the UN has a globalist agenda. And back in 1992, I mean, the UN had the big climate treaty, 196 countries signed on, including the US, and this was to prevent dangerous human-caused climate change by um, eliminating fossil fuel emissions. You know, so we had the policy cart way out in front of the scientific horse from the very beginning of all this. And the IPCC was charged at providing evidence for dangerous human-caused climate change. Um, this narrow framing completely marginalized natural climate variability. It neglected to consider any benefits from warming. It assumed that warming was dangerous. And it early on keyed onto a single, you know, policy option, which was to eliminate CO2 emissions with a preferred um, policy of incorporating wind and solar power. And yes. so we had a very narrow framing of both the problem and the solution. Well, and this, this raises the whole question about whether um, this body, and, and as I've done a, a deep dive into it, I had no idea that you've got working group one that does the science. That's the real scientific underpinnings of everything. But then the policymakers and the diplomats, and they get involved in this and they start kind of drawing all kinds of conclusions that they want to put out to the public and kind of rewriting the science in a way. And that, that I had no idea that was going on. That stunned me. Yeah, um, the, the, the working group one report is the most reliable of the IPCC reports, but the summary for policymakers is really um, written in collaboration with policymakers and then, you know, so it's a political yeah, document. Oh, it's, it's a political doc. The summary for policymakers is definitely a political document. There is some good parts to the working group one report. Once you get to the working group two report on impacts and the working group three um, report on politics, I, I mean, on mitigation, it's almost all politics at that point. But all the reporters and the journalists focus on is the summary of the IPCC report. So what they're giving the public may not have anything to do with science. Uh, yeah, it's carefully crafted spin. By the time it gets to the public, it's pure spin. See, this is very, very troubling to me because everything, the reason that I have done a lot of shows on this is this is the axle from which everything is spoking out. 
All of the major policy decisions we are making right now have to do with this issue. This impacts everything we're doing. So we better get it right. And, and my fear is that there is not an open, honest debate about this. Well, for sure there's not an open and honest debate. I mean, anybody who speaks up in opposition to this established UN narrative, you know, gets mar ignored, marginalized, canceled, insulted, and so on. You know, I've been called a denier, a serial climate disinformer, a climate heretic, and so on. I mean, just for raising some questions <laughs> and providing some alternative perspectives. Well, you're in good company. I'm, th I'm thinking of, of, you know, the people that, that I've talked to and read, uh, Stephen Coonan, Richard Lindzen, Clauser, who we mentioned already, Pilkey, Roger Pilkey, who I've had on the program, uh, John Christie. There is a lengthy group, and what I notice about the people who are speaking out saying, wait a minute, time out, we've got a problem, but it's not a crisis. These people are all tenured and their academic backgrounds are so impeccable that it's not going to ruin their career to speak what they say is the truth. Um, oh, it still hurts, even if you're tenured. Um, Roger Pilkey Jr. is not in a, <laughs> a happy place um, where he is, even though he's tenured and his job is protected. Um, I ended up leaving my tenured position because the whole situation became untenable. So it's not entirely a happy situation. But a lot of these people, you know, Steve Kuna and Richard Lindzen, I mean, they're retired. Okay, so they yes. don't have anything to lose by speaking up. But these are so, physicists. These are very, I mean, their their credentials are... Impeccable. Yes. So, I mean, when people like that speak up, you would think the public and the media would say, hey, we, we need to maybe listen to these folks for a second. That is not happening. No, it's a very sad state of affairs, and all this is amplified in the media. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, you know, the media were, you know, sort of watchdogs. You know, they were always trying to, you know, look, look for what might not be right about all this. But, but the media is totally in the tank, and they're actually amplifying the alarms. So okay. you have, <laughs> there's no accountability anymore. No, I, I, I mean, honestly, guilty as charged, just speaking broadly here. But I, I want to get back to this idea of kind of this, this group think that has taken over this debate. Number one, why is it that every singular weather event, big weather event, is attributed to climate change? It happens within the first few minutes of, of coverage. Okay, well, even the IPCC acknowledges that there's very little relationship between extreme weather and the warming trend. Heat waves is maybe the only thing, you know, that there's any confidence, you know, hurricanes, floods, droughts, tornadoes, whatever. I mean, that there's, there's no evidence in the historical record or a trend that looks like it's associated with fossil fueled warming. So this is the IPCC. So what the heck is going on? Well, um, the communicators and the advocates realize very early on that people don't care about the slow creep of warming. However, these extreme weather events, if we can blame these on climate change, you know, then we, um, then we get people's attention and people are more willing to <laughs> agree with the radical policies. But there's little basis um, in observations or fact linking these extreme weather events to fossil fueled warming. And no, that's trying. exactly right. It's right there in the report. It's, it's, yeah. You have to go to working group one to get it, but it's, it's there. Uh, there, are no, there are no trends with, with the exception of heat waves, exactly what you said. But uh, hurricanes, floods, fires, all of that, there is no linkage that they've established with any kind of certainty. Correct. If we were, Judith, to eliminate all carbon emissions right now, what would be the effect on the global temperature? Well, um, a bunch of climate modelers did this experiment 
and they shut off all emissions and they kept running their climate models out for 50 years and after 50, you know 50 years later some models were still warming some were cooling but you know there was it really didn't do very much and there wasn't a completely <laughs> clear signal from how the climate models would react to this there's a great deal of uncertainty in the global carbon cycle and how the planet actually you know digests the carbon and would react to something like that so we don't really know but in any event um we're not going to see any change to the climate or extreme weather events you know during the 21st century you know maybe something in the 22nd century things might just slow down a little bit but this isn't going to do anything to help us in the 21st century by immediately um getting rid of all of our fossil fuel emissions so, so before we know exactly what we're going to accomplish here so before we break your bottom line is We've got a problem. We are warming slightly, uh, 1.1 degrees Celsius in about the last 140 years. That's about it, right? Um, pretty much. <laughs> okay, so you would say no crisis. Problem, no crisis. Yeah, climate change and variability is an ongoing predicament that humans have had to deal with I mean, since they've been on the planet Earth, um, they have to deal with it now and we'll have to deal with it in the future, whether or not we're increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. So we just need to accept that and get on with it. Judith Curry is the former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology. She is also the author of a new book called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. Back with Judith Curry in a moment. We're going to talk about sea level rise and where we go from here on Newsmaker Saturday. Welcome back on Newsmaker Saturday. Dr. Judith Curry is a climatologist, former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology and the author of a new book called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. Judith, thanks for uh, rejoining us here. Um, sea level rise. Uh, my calculation is we, we've we've seen sea level rise about a foot in a century. Is that a is that pretty close? Um, it's a little less than that, actually. Global sea level rise is more like about eight inches in the last century. Is that a crisis? Um, no, it's it's a slow creep um, that we're able to adapt to, and a lot of local sea level rise is caused by the land actually sinking from geologic processes or groundwater withdrawal. But so what we get from the UN Secretary General, uh, Gutierrez, is a picture of him on the cover of a magazine uh, in an island where the water's up to his waist, and it's just hyperbolic. And, and by the way, that island is sinking of its own, own right, and I can't remember the name. You know what I'm talking about. This is the kind of stuff we're getting constantly. I mean, it's dishonest. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's um, propaganda. Um, you know, if if the politicians could really describe this honestly, I think we would get more people on board to actually trying to figure out how to deal with all this in a pragmatic way. But at this point, you get so much backlash from all that apocalyptic rhetoric and hyperbole. Did you get drummed out of uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology because you, I won't say you were a doubter, but you were saying, wait a minute, we've got to look at both sides of this thing. Okay, um, in, in 2009, I started speaking out about my concerns that the IPCC was overconfident in its conclusions, particularly related to the climate models. They weren't dealing with uncertainty appropriately. They were neglecting natural variability and, and so on. And I also was, I was concerned about the activism and political advocacy of many of the IPCC authors and even the chairman. And I was also concerned about what I regarded as unethical behavior by some of the IPCC authors. Okay, this made me very, very unpopular. And so the establishment figured out that the best way to deal with me was just to call me a, a denier 
dismiss me, try to discredit me, try to mess up my career, which I pretty much accomplished. Um, the administrators at Georgia Tech wanted me gone. Um, in 2017, I ended up resigning my position. Um, it became apparent to me that I was an unhirable in academia, even though I had brought a lot to the table. I mean, if you Google Judith Curry back then, Judith Curry, climate denier, Judith Curry, abandoned science, you know, Judith Curry, serial climate misinformer, Judith Curry, climate heretic, you know, and so, you know, there's just, my, you know, my career in academia was old, over and I left for the private sector, which I find to be much more honest. With Can you tell to me, weather. Judith, I, I'm curious about this. There seems to be an avalanche of money, grant money, money pouring into the universities to push this idea that we're heading toward Armageddon. Can you explain that and why there isn't some balance on the other side? Can you get published if you want to, if you want to say, hey, listen, um, some of this has problems. We need to take a deeper dive at this. Or maybe this particular problem isn't as serious as we thought it was. Can you get published? Uh, you can, but not in the prestige journals. I mean, Science and Nature, which are the two prestigious uh, journals, will not publish anything that doesn't hew to the narrative. They won't even send out your paper for review. That strikes okay. me as dangerous. It just does. As a journalist... Oh, oh, it's terrible. I mean, it torques the, the climate in a terrible way. And then you've got the funding agencies who, you know, send out announcement of opportunity for proposals you know, that are targeted at supporting this narrative. You know, so if you want to get funding to do something else, well, good luck. The evidence is, is just um, diverging so much from this apocalyptic rhetoric well, that's being put there. People are starting to question it. And now uh, there's something we're seeing a lot of, um, on, certainly on social media, but all over the place, a sixth mass extinction event. I mean, there are scientists at NASA talking about this. Peter Kalmus is one of them. We've got a bunch of people saying that we are heading towards extinction. That seems very extreme. Um, it is extreme. Okay, but let's face it. We have 8 billion people on the planet. Of course, we're going to have some sort of impact on the environment and other species. I mean, land use is a far bigger issue than CO2 emissions. So... Um, and, and this is another concern. What used to be, you know, the environmental movement used to worry about pollution and species and habitats. Now, who cares about all this? <laughs> it's all about climate change and getting rid of fossil fuel emissions. So, so we've lost the perspective, of, you know, that the traditional environmentalists provided us with. We've got about a minute left. Are we prepared for some type of mass transition? And would you urges to slow the roll on trying to uh, go to a, a fully electric kind of technology, windmill, solar. Okay, the, the biggest risk we face right now is a, a rapid transition away from fossil fuels. This has not been thought out. It has not been planned. This mad rush to tearing down nuclear gas and coal plants and replacing them with wind and solar has proven to be a fiasco in every place that has been tried um, to a large extent. I mean, Germany <laughs> has, um, has gone back to burning coal because they, they just <laughs> they don't have any energy. Uh, their industrial base has fled. Their economy is in tatters. I mean, this is what we face if we pursue this too rapidly. Sure, let's transition over the course of the 21st century to better energy sources. I think nuclear and geothermal are really good choices, but this urgency of eliminating fossil fuels is by far and away the biggest risk we're facing right now on the planet. Dr. Judith Curdy, climatologist, former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology, author of the new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. Dr. Curry, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time on Newsmaker Saturday.